How are you all doing this morning? We're here to worship the Lord together, and it's just a beautiful day, and so I just want to invite you to stand and worship together with me. Father, it's who you are. 
take a moment to greet each other. Good morning, Calvary Chapel, Roseville. How are we today? Mm, some murmurs. Good. We have somebody answering who's on the ball. Excellent. Excellent. 
Okay, if you can tell, I got a lot of scribbles today, so uh, we got to get into this because we got plenty for the announcements. If this is your first time at Calvary Roseville, uh, we are delighted you're here. We'd love to get to know you a little better. We have these blue cards that are behind all the seats, uh, and they let us know a little bit about yourself. Uh, so please stick around, if not the blue card, at least stick around. We'd like to get to know you. Also, there are uh, chocolate, chip, chocolate chip cookies back in the Solid Rock Cafe for sale, or if this is your first time, they are free for you. So, uh, so take that. So, uh, we came back from the rescue mission last night. We had six who gave their lives to Christ, so praise the Lord. You can clap for that, yes. Uh, let's see, coming July 23rd, chili dogs, chips, and drinks after church, all for a donation to pay off our second mortgage. We will even offer sauerkraut if you want a kraut dog, which I think is a little unwise, borderline immoral myself, but I'm not a sauerkraut fan. So, please make plans to buy a meal. That's in two weeks, okay, two weeks. Uh, we have Bible studies throughout the week. Uh, ladies Bible study, join us this Thursday, July 13th, 10 a.m. or 7 p.m. to begin the study called Breathe with Priscilla Shire. Call Wind if you have any questions on that. Men's Bible study, we are in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 8 already. We are flying through the book of Revelation, so that is on Tuesday nights, also at 7 p.m. Uh, we have a few retreats coming up. The ladies' retreat is coming up August 25th through 27th. Cost is $200. Uh-oh. Oh, oh we got a note. Oh, please. I'm going to jump in right now because we're talking about the retreat. And as it is coming up in just about six weeks from now, we need to button it all up. So if you haven't signed up yet and you are interested in coming, we would love to have you. It's going to be an awesome weekend in Lake Tahoe. We have a great speaker, wonderful worship and fellowship with the Lord and with your sisters. So, and we actually have some scholarship available too. If it's thinking like you maybe don't know if you can afford to go, please talk to us about it because we really want everyone to be able to make it. So talk to me afterwards or Leslie or Angela. She's around here too. So we'd like to get that all sealed up. And if you owe any money on your tuition, if you could get that paid in the next week or so, that'd be great too because we need to make our payment to the resort up, up in Tahoe. So that, with that said, I'll let Jeremy continue with the regular announcements. Thanks. The regular, regular announcements. Yes. All right, men. We also have a retreat coming up, but it's in October. A little ways out, 6th through the 8th, called Building the Church. So uh, save the date for that if you can. Uh, let's see. A heartfelt thank you to everyone who helped with the fireworks booth, buying our phantom, works, our phantom fireworks, helping the answer the phones, the front office, all that. So it was a big success. So we thank you all for that. Uh, let's see. We have a men's breakfast coming up, August 12th. Uh, youth Bible study. Uh, let's see. We have a youth summer retreat coming up. If you're a youth or a parent of a youth, you should be listening because it'll be fun. It's the end of July. That's this month. So coming up 28th through the 30th. It's in Geyserville. Uh, it's a big house. And it's got a lake. and It's got a big bouncy trampoline thing. Trampoline? Trampoline thing on the lake. It's fantastic. Okay. So it's going to be a great time. It's only $20 per person. So do that if you can. Uh, let's see. The Bible bus is on Wednesdays as I go back to Bible study. Uh, every Wednesday, you guys are in the book of Ephesians. Also, at the same time, youth Bible study uh, will be taking back up again starting this Wednesday as well. Uh, and you are in Revelation. Revelation, okay? Uh, baptism is coming up. Sign-up sheet is in also in the back. July 30th, you can be baptized. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, there's, uh, you can talk to Pastor Ken or Jane or Jim. Uh, so that is July 30th. Uh, also, we are in need of another projection and sound servant needed. Uh, so that is a need also. And lastly, uh, baby bottles. Uh, start saving your change if you haven't already because the Alternative Pregnancy Center, uh, that um, bottles are coming where you throw the, all the change you have in the bottles for them. So I think that is all. If we can have the ushers come forward for this morning's offering. This is also a great time to silence your cell phones, if you have not already. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time. Uh, your word says your thoughts and your ways are far above ours. Uh, we acknowledge that. We ask for your perspective on everything that's going on in our lives and around us. Um, give us that love that only you can provide. Uh, we thank you for these things. Bless these tithes and offerings. Use them for your glory as you know you will in Jesus' name. Amen.
tempted and tried, you were. The Word became flesh, bore my sin and death. Now you're risen. Everything I once held dear. Leave.
Jesus, that we can be pure in your sight, Lord. You've purified us, and we just come before you this morning and ask you to continue to refine us, Lord, and make us more like you, and give us the desire to know more about you and to be closer to you this morning. We give you this time ahead in worship, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. How are we all doing? All right, getting through the summer, the heat. Well, praise God, we are so happy the fireworks week has ended. Thank you so much for all the help. Incredible, awesome help. Ooh, that's a pain. Yes, we are thankful. That's why it makes more noise in the pocket than out. This morning, our scripture, chapter 2, I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18. When we change books, it always, I want to be back in that first book someplace. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18. If you'll turn there in your Bibles, if you don't have a Bible, Raise your hand, and we'll get a Bible to you. And there's, okay, Bible back here. And you can keep that Bible if you need a Bible. It's a gift from us to you. The title, The Lesser Becomes the Greater. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you, and we give thanks for this day. We give thanks for the Word of God, Lord. The written Word, of course, but also, Lord, you, the Word of God. We thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for the magnificence of the Trinity, how you put the Trinity together, and how incredible it is working out in our lives. And we thank you, Jesus, that when we embrace it, when we grasp it, when we hold on to the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our lives change. And this morning, let the Word go through us and go out from us during the week and let us be changed. And let people in our community see that change in us and let that speak of you as we become more like you, as we grow in you and you work through us. May this be so. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, last week we found the apostle which apostle? Paul. We found the apostle Paul telling the saints at the city in Greece called Corinth, Corinth that unlike some others, Paul had no need to qualify himself, to prove his credentials, to prove that he was an apostle chosen by Christ himself. He didn't need to provide a letter or letters of, of recommendation. He didn't need to explain why it was so, why he was an apostle, but yet he would explain. He cared about people, and he realized that we can be dense, we can be stiff-necked, we can be people who are easily confused, and we need explanation. We need things spelled out for us. And when I first came to a Calvary Chapel, I was reading the King James Bible, New Believer, 
couldn't understand much, Bible illiterate, came to a Calvary chapel, and Pastor Bob up in Yuba City would explain the scriptures, passage verse by verse, not topicals, but verse by verse, expounding through each chapter, each passage. And as I listened, and also, of course, they turned me over to the New King James Bible, which helped a lot from King James. Well, as I listened, I realized, wow, I can understand this. And then it came to the point where I could understand it reading it by myself. And I'll never forget that experience. And that's why I've been Calvary Chapel, because I think that is the way to go, for people to have the Bible. When I was back east one time, I went to a Catholic church with my parents, give the Catholics another chance. It's been 20 years since I last visited a Catholic church. This was 20 years ago, probably. And nothing had changed. The priest made the statement, the biggest problem, the biggest mistake of the church happened 200 years ago when we put the Bible in the hands of the people. And I said, oh, and then he talked about the, the uh, infallible Holy Father. And I go, nothing's changed here. Well, the Bible should be in the hands of the people. Amen? And this morning, it's in the hands of each person here. Amen? Okay. I'm going to give a review, a quick review, of last week because it ties together. This chapter ties together. It's usually traditionally broken into two, verses 1 through 11 and verses 12 through 18, when it's taught. But we'll begin with verse 1, for those of you especially who were not here last week. Paul says, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Lord, we just ask that you'd help us to understand this. Lord, we ask that you'd help us to be able to get the practical from it. And Father God, that it would change us, that we would grow. We would be, and all growth is, is looking more like you, being more like you. You're the model, Jesus, for the potter's clay. You, the potter, Father God, take us, the clay, and you make us look like Jesus. And that's the whole deal. And we thank you for that. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, there were those that needed to, to be recommended, commended? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ. This is speaking to each of you this morning. Ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone like the law, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. The good flesh, the heart. Not the flesh where we do things in the flesh that are sinful or whatever. Now, Paul's qualification was by the Holy Spirit. Not a letter from others or the letter of the law. He didn't need to produce biblical degrees or letters of testimony. The fact was, he was no longer Saul the Pharisee. He was now Paul the great apostle in Jesus Christ, the Lord's bondservant, the chosen bondservant of Jesus Christ. Filled with the Holy Spirit to overflowing, driven by the Holy Spirit, and living by the way of the Spirit. And we have such a trust through Christ towards God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves. But our sufficiency is from God. Paul got it. It was not Paul. It was not me. It was not my performance, my works. It was God Almighty. I'm not driving the car, hopefully. God is driving the car. The Holy Spirit is providing the gasoline that fires the pistons, hopefully. Who also made us, now he declares not that we are sufficient of ourselves. Who also, verse 6, made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. 
For the letter kills. Now that's a strong statement. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives what? Life. Amen. Paul's telling them it's no longer good enough to just follow the rules, the law, the regulations, those things that they had become so familiar with, so, so good at, but now there's something more. The lesser is being turned into the greater. However, greater responsibility, but the main responsibility is on the Lord. If we let him take responsibility, if we give him responsibility for our lives, yes, we have to do what's right and not do what's wrong. We don't just throw the rules out of the, out of the world, out of the book. We don't just say, well, you know, sloppy, agape, greasy grace, now I can do anything. No. But it's a whole new ball game. It's not the old covenant. It's the new covenant. It's not the law. It's grace and faith and love that motivates us. Not fear, not being afraid that if we do something wrong, God is going to slam us. He's going to, you know, just put a step on us and, and, and jump on us or, you know, take a bat to us. But we have this new motivation that because of his love, that we cherish, that we embrace, that we're showered with, we want to love him back. And because of that, we want to love others. That's the new covenant. Grace. God, the Father, so loved us, he gave his only begotten son to die on that cross for you and for me. Not because we deserved it, not because we followed the law. In fact, in my case, I was quite lawless at the time but because of his love for me. And that's what finally penetrated my heart. And that's why I love back, because I realize that incredible love, that boundless love. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, the law was glorious, and there was a certain amount of glory to it, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, and this is, this is important, these four words, five words. Which glory was passing away? How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation of the Old Covenant had glory, and it did, to a certain extent, limited, but to a certain extent, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because, the glory, because of the glory that excels. For, what if, for if what is passing away was glorious, the old covenant, what remains is much more glorious. The old covenant of the law was passing away, being replaced by a new covenant of grace, faith, and love. And throughout Paul's writings we find the principle of the lesser to the greater. In Romans chapter 8, verse 32, for example. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Do we have that one? He who did not spare his own son. Who is he? The father. Who's the son? Jesus. But delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Powerful scripture. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all on a cross. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? As great as the cross is, how wonderful grace is. We do nothing to be saved except say, well, I want my sins forgiven and, and I, I give into that and I want to be saved. And then that's it. There's no works. There's no performance. There's no changing your life. But instantly in that moment, you are righteous and born again. Amen? Incredible stuff. But more to come. Also, freely, he gives us all things. Now, most would say giving your only begotten son was plenty. Amen? I would say that. But not God. 
God doesn't say that. God's desire is to bless us beyond our expectations. And we might say, well, you know, I, I'm waiting for that, and, or I can't wait for that. I want that now. But you know what? You do have it now. It's just, but you don't see it. Why? Because we're so blinded. That's why. We're blinded, and we don't see the blessings. God's desire is to bless us beyond our expe expectations. Less becoming more, constantly, consistently, daily. God freely gives us all things. Paul wanted all things in his life. Paul knew it was by dying of self, not by performance, but dying of yourself, giving yourself up to the Lord, that we become the greater. The law leads to death, the word here tells us. The desire of self-righteousness leads to death. However, the law leads to death by design because the design is when we see that our self-righteousness will never get us there and that we fail. This happened to me in Bible college where I realized this. Then the truth can be revealed to us. I can't do it, but he can. I can't, he can. And the law leads us to the place where we realize we will fail. And that, then when we're at that place, we look for the alternative. And that's when we have Jesus. Last week, we left at, off at verse 12. Therefore, since we have such hope, that hope being in the Spirit, not in the law, but in the Spirit, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Now, you see many people, and for many t years, I thought, oh, the veil was there because Moses was shining so brightly that it would hurt their eyes and blind them, and they just, or knock them down. And so they, so he put the veil on. Well, that wasn't the reason, Paul tells us, for the veil. The veil was so that they wouldn't see the diminishing, the fading glory. Paul? Okay, let's see where we are. Passing away. But their minds were blinded. Blinded is a dark, heavy word. Blinded. You can't see. You can't see anything. You're blinded. For until this day... The same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Now he's speaking of the Jews here. And even to this day, our day, the same veil remains unlifted. And they read the Old Testament, but they need Christ. The Old Testament, the law will never take the veil away. What that veil is like a wall between you and the glory of God. It has to be taken away by Christ and none other. In verse 15, but even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. This speaks of Israel. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, to Jesus, Jew or Gentile, I'm adding that, Jew or Gentile, the veil is taken away. It's not when you turn your life into something good, where you're doing everything right, where you're holy, you're spiritual, you've got the Christian language down. No, it's when the veil is taken away by Jesus. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there's freedom. But we all, with unveiled face, we all, we Christians, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, we're being changed, we're growing into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now you see, Paul is a Philippians 3.3 3 Christian. Philippians 3.3, 3. do we have that? Yes. For we are the circumcision. Now, who were the originally circumcised people? 
the Jews. You had to be circumcised to be a Jew. But now we are the circumcision. And are, it's not the cutting away of flesh as in the Old Testament circumcision, but now it's a circumcision of the heart. The whole God cutting away at that moment of being born again the fleshliness of the heart and giving us a new heart. For we are the circumcision who worship God, we worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have what? No, N-O, no confidence in the flesh. Now that's tough. Now I was really great with confidence in the flesh. Like when I was in Bible college, that was like my glory days of, of confidence in the flesh and following the rules and regulations man it was it was officers training camp or training school uh you know they purposely just treated us like uh, they would if you were in some elite military school where they trained officers and you just kind of got the flesh beaten down and and you just had this schedule didn't watch tv for two years and whatnot and uh you get into this thing and, and you start to feel, wow, man, I'm, I'm really doing it. But they would teach us no confidence in the flesh. And we would see fellow students fall away, some from dishonesty, others sexual sin, different money, different things, and they'd fall away as we would go through this process. Now here in Scripture, we see a picture of Moses in the Old Testament with a veil covering his face. Now, the veil is a symbol of the Old Covenant. That is the law, the Ten Commandments, that demanded a certain behavior and performance and works to be right with God. Now, we don't throw this stuff out the window. You know, we, we do out of love and out of a new spirit, a born-again spirit in us, the Holy Spirit living in us, we do change. For me, I didn't have to have people tell me what was right or wrong in my life, and I didn't know what was right or wrong. When I became born again, I thought right was wrong and wrong was right. I didn't know the difference because of the community that I had come out of. And I came to find out later, but what happened as soon as I became born again, instantly, as Paul did, when he was on the road to Damascus, he didn't have to go to Jerusalem and learn it from the apostles and, and the disciples. The Holy Spirit spoke to him, changed him, and gave him a new thinking. And I realized, man, my thinking is like spaghetti. It's just all tangled up. It's just a mess. And I began to instantly realize, whoa, you know what? And then when I went to church, it was reinforced. At church, I'd hear, yeah, right, don't do that. That's wrong. And do this. That's right. But the Holy Spirit was my first encounter of right and wrong. Not people telling me. And this very veil ends up being a barrier of performance between us and God's glory. Now remember this. The law was never designed to save. But to force us to see the one who does save. That was the purpose of the law. The law was put in place so that we would fail, that we would then, that the Jews would fail. Now, unfortunately, the Jews didn't get it, but they should have been able to get it, to see that this isn't working. This isn't getting us closer to God. This isn't giving us liberty or freedom, but this is putting us more and more into bondage. And we need to be set free. It's all about being set free. But they didn't get it. The law was never designed to save, but to force us to see the one who does save. And they were so blinded by the light of the law that they couldn't see their Messiah, Jesus, even when he was there right in front of them. Now, when Moses came down from the mountaintop, his face was glowing. It was shining. It was glorious. It was a symbol of the glory that comes when we successfully do what's right. Even, and this is circular, and Paul, so much of Paul's teachings sound circular until you really dig into them and you compare them and you take them and look at other of his teachings. And this sounds circular, but his shining face was a symbol of the glory that comes 
when we successfully keep the law of God. Sound contradictory? Well, every Christian has felt that attraction at times. We love it when we do something righteous, and we know it. Look what I did for that person. Man, I feel good. We went and, and, and we gave Christmas presents out this year to families. We adopted families and gave them Christmas presents. I mean, I delivered those gifts, and I felt, man, that was, I felt so good. Or look how generous I am. I, I, we, I helped that, we helped that family out. Or I prayed, and this happened. Yeah, through my prayers, that, was, that happened. Or, or look how I made the right choice to serve the Spirit, not the flesh. Look how holy I am. Look at what I did. My righteous, my righteous acts make me feel so good. And they do. Now, not to say that we shouldn't live sanctified lives, that we shouldn't do good things for people, nice things for people, help people, that we shouldn't make the right decisions instead of the wrong decisions, that we shouldn't have lives sanctified, set apart from the world, lives that disdain sin, but that our sanctified lives need to be rooted in something greater than the law of Moses. The new covenant is based upon the greatest commandment of all, which is, huh? What? Yeah, yeah, love the Lord God with everything, with your whole heart, mind, and strength with everything, all in. Loving Christ because he so loves me. And I can't help but love him back. Now, if Christ hadn't died for me, if I hadn't become born again, if I hadn't received that Holy Spirit experience, well, you know what? I wouldn't love him because I wouldn't even know him. I would have moved on. I wouldn't have ever even ended up in a church. The problem with my self-righteousness based on works is that I'm a fading glory and always will be. I'll disappoint you. I'll disappoint myself. Sooner or later, I'll disappoint my family. I'll disappoint my community. I'm a fading glory. My righteous act doesn't last. And I use that word act as a verb. My righteous act, you know, the act. Oh, I'm so righteous. It, it doesn't last. Sooner or later, it fades. It has to. And my personal righteousness is as what? A filthy rag. And, and this is gross, but you know what? Sometimes we need the Bible to gross us. In the, in the original language, it's menstrual cloth. That's what it is. It's filthy, my righteousness. But God never leaves his people with the lesser. He always delivers the greater. And in this case, the new covenant, a new way of living, a new power to live. Provided by God in Christ through the Holy Spirit. Always more, never less. Before, you had to do it in the Old Testament. Now he does it through us. And that's so much better. It's so much more effective. It's so much more efficient. And it gives the glory to him, not us. Because you see, when we have the glory, it never works out very well. When we think we're Holy Sally or Holy Bob, it never plays out very well. It always ends up badly. Badly not only for us, but badly for those around us. The new spirit-driven way gives us a, not, not just a right relationship with Jesus, but this total righteousness from the moment we're born again. And mind you, not something we've earned, but something freely given to us, given right from the get-go, instantly. Jesus is doing the work through the Holy Spirit to work within us and through us so that when we do ordinary things, 
they become extraordinary, extraordinary. And God will be at work and great things will happen as a result to the person who is born again, to the person who by grace is saved and released and Jesus is revealed to. The lesser always becomes the greater. Last week we looked at verse 7 through 11. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious and there was glory so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, had the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels the spirit way. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. That's what Paul's talking about. You see, Paul had tapped into this new energy source, this new power source. We're always talking about getting off of coal and natural gas and shale and getting into these renewable energy sources, sun power, wind power, water power. Well, Paul had tapped into spirit power. And verse 12, therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. And that's why Paul just poured out the epistles. When you trust in the new covenant, you become bold. You're not walking around constantly in the state of flux of, well, you know, I did this, which wasn't so good. And so now, you know, I can't, I don't, I can't even witness because I'm just trash and, and I'm too consumed in my guilt and my, my sin and and, and I just, you know, I'm not worthy. I can't even go to church because I might infect people in the church. You know, I can't do that. And I, I can't pray with my family because that would be so hypocritical for me to do so or for me to even quote verses. And you fall into this condemnation and you're always walking unsteadily. But when you're in the Spirit, when you know that you're saved by grace, not by the letter, not by the law, but by grace. Then you walk and you say, yes, I'm a sinner, but saved by grace. And I'm going to share that. Yeah, yeah, no condemnation in Christ Jesus. The accuser of the brethren is Satan, not God. And that's what Paul's talking about. When you trust the new covenant, you become bold. The root meaning of this word boldness is out in the open. You're right out front, out in the open, with all of your little moles and your little uglies and, and whatnot. You're right out front with nothing to hide. You're transparent. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. Amen? Are you a sinner? It wasn't so loud. It was louder when... For me. <laughs> Probably my wife. You see, you can fool the people, but you can't fool your family. You know, you can have this profile with the people that you're this spiritual giant, but your family knows. Your closest friends know. But it's okay. To be right out front, out in the open, with nothing to hide. To be transferred. I'm a sinner. Saved by Jesus. Saved by grace. Saved by faith. Not counting on myself, but I'm counting on God. And therefore, you can be confident and out front, man. Some of my greatest witnesses of leading people to the Lord have been those times where I've shared I am a sinner. And I've told them, you know, this, hey, this is where I come from. And then they realize, whoa, you're the pastor? And that's, how, you know, I, I didn't realize that a guy who once had a BC life like that could even be a pastor. Yeah, in Jesus Christ, your sins are washed clean. And then they have this whole new mindset. They thought they had to perform. Oh, I'll come back to church. When, I'll, I'll start going to church when I've cleaned up my act. How many times have you heard that from someone? Well, it's because they don't understand. They don't understand 2 Corinthians chapter 3. They don't understand what Paul's saying. 
and they think they have to somehow change and clean up before they can receive. They have to do it themselves. And here Paul points out something we would never have known otherwise. You see, we know from Exodus 34 that when Moses came down from the mountain with the law in his hand, he covered his glowing face with a veil. And one would assume that he did so so that he wouldn't blind the people by the brightness of his face. But here Paul says Moses put a veil on his face so that the people of Israel wouldn't see the glow fading. So too, we might do the same. We might keep our rules and regulations, our performance level high for a day or two. Yes, we can shine for a while, but the glory fades quickly because we are sinners. And the fact that the glow fades away indicated the fact that one day the old covenant was going to fade away. It was going to pass. Thank God it did. Can you imagine? How many would, here would be good Pharisees? There's some, believe me. But for the most part, we're not. And even the good Pharisees, like Paul, fail. It was never intended by God to be a permanent covenant agreement. It was not designated to save, but to reveal our need for a Savior, for a Messiah, that being Christ Jesus. Because God knew we would break the law. Why did he know? Because Adam and Eve did it in the perfect state of the garden. They had no challenges. Like we have temptation. They didn't have it. The only temptation was don't eat of the fruit of this. Don't eat that one piece of fruit from this one tree. And they couldn't even do that. And if it were you or I, we wouldn't, we would have eat, we would have did the same thing. But we need to die because eating of the, that fruit brought death. And we need to die of our fleshly pursuits to be killed to live the life of the Spirit. And the way we die is by seeing our hopelessness, our failure to be able to maintain that level of performance. And then we're killed. I was crushed. Man, you know, I was in a denomination where it was all about performance. And once, then when I realized, and also we had the perfection doctrine on top of it, that the Lord couldn't return until the church was spotless and sin-free. It, could only have, it would only have to happen maybe for five seconds, but every Christian on earth would have to be blemish-free before the Lord could come and take the church. And I knew, man, I was just, just going to destroy this whole thing if I were alive when the Lord came, because he wouldn't come because of me. I'd have to be dead. And it was crushing to a point. The law was meant to point us to our need for a deliverer. And at first sight, the light of the law looks attractive, but it fades. And so this veil over Moses' face became a symbol of whatever interferes, whatever hinders the Holy Spirit's work in your life. Paul has been telling us the law has come to kill us, but that's a good thing, to show us that we're completely useless of ourselves, and that's a good thing, because it's so much better when we let go and let God. Amen? So much better. And the veil, the veil can be any distraction in your life. It can be putting a person on a pedestal in your life, oh, I've got to find a woman, or I've got to find a man. That can be the distraction. It can be economic. It can be the government. Oh, the government's going to, you know, I've got to get the right government in, in, into, into Washington, D.C. It can be economic. It can be educational. Once I get this next degree, then I'm going to be cool. Then things will be right. They're all veils. Things that make us think we're really pleasing God can be veils, that we're fulfilling his demands. The veil, therefore, keeps us from receiving the greater life of the Spirit that God is wanting to give us freely, give us freely all things. The veil keeps us blinded to the fact that the law fades. Now, 
there's growth in this passage. It talks about growth. Now, you know, sometimes we fall into it, the category, like Moses, trying to maintain the reputation that Moses had with the people. Maybe he didn't want them to see that when he came out from God's presence, the glory began to fade. And many of us don't want that. We want to maintain this image of spiritual giants when actually we are not at all. But the result for Moses was a lack of boldness or confidence. And Paul contrasts his own boldness with Moses. What Moses did was born out of fear, out of compromise, out of an attempt to hide something that should have been seen. And so often we live in fear. I, I, people tell me, they say, you know, well, I, I, got, I got this sickness. And, you know, is it because I did something wrong? Or, you know, I, I, under this attack, is it because I'm out of God's will? And sometimes, yes, it is. But you have to be careful with that. Because you know what? When you're in God's will, you're going to come under attack. When you're in God's will, you're going to be sick. And so you have to really watch out for that. In verse 14, But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Doesn't mean don't read the Old Testament, by the way. This was for the Jews. But it can be, and for the unsaved. Because the veil is taken away in Christ, that's the only way that that veil will be taken away, that the curtain will be rent. And, but even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart, on the heart of the Jews. The veil will only be lifted when they give up law for Christ. John 5, 39. Jesus said, and this is heavy, Jesus said, you do search the scriptures, you search the scriptures, and they searched the scriptures, and they searched the scriptures, and they broke the scriptures down, and they had classes, and they taught, and they learned. You do search the scriptures, for in them you think you have life. But they testify of me. You see, it has to come down to the Holy Spirit. That's, where it ha that's the end game. And you will not come to me that you might have life. The scriptures are there to lead us to Christ. Now for the believer, they come alive in our hearts and they change us. But if you're not a believer, you can search those scriptures all you want and end up with nothing. Even Christians, if you're in the law and you're not in the spirit, that can happen. And it was so obvious for them that they searched the scriptures as 300 places in the Old Testament of the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled to be their Messiah. They searched, they searched, they found, they found. But they were blinded. There was a veil over their face and they failed to see Christ, the Messiah. Sad, tragic. And it's interesting that to this day in Israel, an atheist can become an Israeli citizen. No problem. A Buddhist can become an Israeli citizen, no problem. A Muslim can become an Israeli citizen. It's more difficult, but still doable. The only ones they deny citizenship are Christians. The veil is still over their face and over their heart. They have a hardness of heart towards the Messiah meaning that it becomes a continual, a continual situation, a continual condition like Pharaoh had when God turned his heart to stone. It was continual, continuous, a state of mind, mind that they enter into. Now remember, this message from Paul is not an attack on Judaism. Not at all. He's not attacking Judaism. What he's doing is, is he's using Moses and Israel as an illustration of something that is true of Christians. That's what he's doing. Where's that hole there? After all, his concern here is for the believers to whom he's writing to here in Corinth and through them to us as well, down through the ages. He didn't know that, but the Holy Spirit knew that we would be here dissecting 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 
You see, these people had become Christians. They had entered in. And by faith, the Spirit of God had entered their human spirit. And that established them in a relationship, a personal relationship with Christ that could not be broken, could not be ended. In the Spirit, at the deep level of human consciousness, they were already linked up to God in an open, a boldness, an open, out in the open, clear relationship. But the trouble was, and our trouble is, their soul, their mind, will, and emotions. In their conscience experience of life, the part we are aware of, because that's all we really know for sure, they still believe if they tried hard enough, if they did enough giving, they, the little mustard seeds of a tithe and all that, they still believed if they tried hard enough, they could keep themselves from evil and so live a life pleasing to God without degenerate spirit. And here's what happens. Once we become a Christian, we receive the, the, the gift of salvation by faith and grace. Amen, we got that? Okay, but here's what happens. And we thank God, first of all, that we have that. And we're like, man, so energized and oh, whoa, this is incredible. This is, you know, wow, this is how it should be. Can you, can you remember that day? I, rem I remember that day, that night. And we thank God that we have that. And then we immediately begin to set up rules and conduct of engagement. Usually for a while we begin to submit to somebody, to somebody else's rules, maybe a mentor, the person that led us to Christ. Or the church can become our mentor. And then we begin to set up our own rules next. That's the next thing we do. We grow. Now I can decide what's right and what's wrong for myself. Ever heard that from a Christian? The Lord tells me. First, there's the obvious. Oh, murdering people, stealing, adultery, drunkenness, all those things. But then we begin to add others. Drinking a glass of wine. That's out. Smoking. That's out. I'm not saying these things are good to do. But then things like dancing become wrong. Going to the movies becomes wrong. And not, you know, I'm not saying going to the movies is a good thing to do. And there's no limit to where you can go in that direction of these things. You can do like the Amish people do. And say wearing buttons or using zippers is wrong on your clothes. Or like the Church of Christ playing instruments on a Sunday morning or in the church is wrong absolutely the devil and there are groups that believe that once you've made their list whatever it is once you're once you've got your no-nos clear then all you have to do is to be approved of God is to keep the list and then you're good but those are all external things and the more you think you're succeeding what happens pride you puffed up more and more and more. It builds up, and pride goes before a fall. The pride inside grows strong, and it begins to develop, and sooner or later, people will see it. It'll be revealed. It'll be out in the open. They'll see your pride. And then you begin to look down on some folks. Maybe not the folks in the church at first, but yeah, probably you know, <laughs> the folks in the church. Because the folks in the church are supposed to be perfect. And if they're not, then they're what? Hypocrites. Most Christ Christians suffer from some form of this or other. Personally, I look down on people. I had to realize, personally, I look down on people who look down on people. And that's wrong. That's not right. But that was a revelation. That was a now moment in my life when I realized that I look down on people who, you know, don't, who look down on other people. Certain people are acceptable to you at that point. Others you can't stand. Usually you can't stand anyone who doesn't have your sin. You begin to develop a critical spirit. You begin to see your sin in a better light 
on you than on them. And it's a psychological fact that, like, like who was it? Uh, Jimmy Swagger. Jimmy Swagger would get up there, man, and he'd sweat and he'd sweat. Man, about sexual sin and all this. Meanwhile, Jimmy Swagger fell because of sexual sin. But that's how psychology works. That's how the human spirit works. The very thing that we have in us, we hate the most in others, but we're blinded to it. We don't realize it. We don't realize we have a critical, judgmental spirit and that we have a negative attitude towards others. And that's because we're blind to the sin. If we saw ourselves, we would see that we're wretchedly self-righteous. But we really think God approves of, of us. And then we're like the Pharisees. And Jesus scorched and burned the Pharisees with his words because they were so disgusting in their self-righteousness. But because we're blinded to our own sin, we see no need to repent. And that's sad. Turning from sin to the Lord. Until we repent, and we turn from sin into the Lord, we can't have the veil removed because it's only by turning to the Lord that the veil can be removed. Amen? And so Paul's telling us to look right at it and see it for what it is. In verse 16, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, in verse 16, the veil's taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, Isaiah 66 and Romans 11 tells us that one day the blinders will be removed from Israel. Now, I don't personally think we will live to see it, because I don't think the church will be there when this happens. Blindness has happened to Israel in part until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, till the Lord takes us in the rapture, and then all of Israel shall be saved. That's when their hearts will turn to the Lord. Verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit. Hmm, that's interesting. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed this is important transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord here we find the glory of the unveiled face the freedom of the Spirit the Spirit's identity the mark of his presence but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. You see, Romans 3.11 tells us there's none righteous because none seeks after God. And we're able to see, only able to see the Lord by his grace because he's lifted the veil from our eyes. We can look into his face. And that changes us. The more we look into his face, the more we're changed. We're changed by a person, by Jesus, by spending time with him, learning about him, and worshiping him, staying in the scriptures, spending time in the word daily, coming together for Bible study, coming to church, looking at him, that we become like him. That's our job, and it works, but it always has to be him. It has to be the spirit, not us. That's the key. Amen? Paul's not saying that the Holy Spirit and Jesus the Lord are one and the same. He means that they are so interlinked in purpose, they are so bonded together in purpose, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and in function, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that they seem to be the same. You can almost exchange one for another. They are the way to life. That is why to walk in fellowship with Christ and to walk in the fullness of the Spirit is to talk of the same thing. And it's the big picture, walking in the way, the Holy Spirit revealed living in us. God wants you to be freer than those in the world. The only thing wrong is the way we do it. We're being taught in the world that the way to be me is to think about my benefit my efforts my accomplish accomplishments and defend and demand them 
But there's a difference. Verse 18, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as the Spirit of the Lord. And here we find the increasing glory from the lesser to the greater. Yes, there is the glory of us walking in the law and accomplishing the law, but there's a greater glory when we walk in the Spirit and the Spirit accomplishes through us. Without us even knowing what we're doing half the time, love is the fulfillment of the law, the very demand that God made in the law. You tried so hard in your self-effort to do the rules and the performance and the regulations, but it came down, Pharisees, Sadducees, to loving. That's what it was really all about. That's being in the image of God, of Jesus. And they missed that part because they were blinded and they thought it was all about them doing something. And really, it was all about the Holy Spirit, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit imparting that love in them and then pouring out through them. Ephesians 4, 32. He wants us to be forgiving. He wants to restore us into the image of him that we lost in the garden. Ephesians 4, 32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That's the bottom line. Amen? A loving person is already fulfilling the law. They're compassionate, understanding, forgiving, firm when it comes to right and wrong, but they know how to speak the truth in love. Not constantly criticizing, judging, picking on others, looking for weakness, but building people up. Notice, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Not from you, not from me, but from Him. That's how it works. It's soul-shaking, those moments of truth. We've all had them. You think you're going along through life. You're eating your spiritual Wheaties. You're doing okay or doing great, you think. And suddenly you discover the rug's being pulled out from under you. And you discover, man, something's wrong. Something's not perfect. Something's lacking love. Something has a judgmental spirit, a selfishness to it, sin. And that something stinks. And that something is my armpit odor, spiritually. But then you come to the Lord and you realize, Lord, I need you. Lord, give me what you have. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we're being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. That's it. That's the model. It's like the potter and the clay. And who's the model or the painter? Leonardo da Vinci. You've got a model. Well, the Lord's got a model. The potter who works on us. We're the clay. We have lumps in us. We resist. Sometimes the potter has to stop and smash the pot, the clay pot, and get that lump kneaded out. Sometimes the Lord does that to us. Has to. But what he's modeling it, us into is Jesus. To look more like Jesus each day. 1 John 3, 2. For beloved, now we are the sons of God. It doesn't yet appear what we are going to be. You see, we're going to be better than what we see right now. Thank you, Jesus. It doesn't yet appear what we are going to be, but we know when he appears, we are going to be like him. Now, the perfection doctrine was wrong, but they had a part right. Yes, we are increasingly to be like him, but first he's going to come. Not first we look like him totally, and then he comes. They had it a little bit backward. But let God do your best let him do the rest. Let go. Let God this day see what happens. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. As you, Lord, are conforming us into the image of the model of Jesus Christ. And each day we become more like him. Lord, more like you. And Lord, remove this very moment, because you can do it in a nanosecond, remove any veils that might be over our eyes this morning that keep us from seeing your glory, that keep us from living the way of the Spirit. There are so many attractive things in the world, Lord, that distract us. And we get our eyes off of you and on those things. And Lord, you know what they are in our life. Each life is different. And Lord, you know we get caught, caught up in different things, even work itself. And it postpones that transformation. And so, Lord, remove those distractions from us this day. Work in us this morning, Jesus. Let us behold your glory with unveiled faces that we may take another step forward in our walk with you this day. And the lesser may become the greater. We might die, we might be killed of our old man of the flesh, crucified of that, and we might have the new man in you, the new woman in you, that we might, might be this day elevated to another level of glory in our fellowship with you, in our allowing you to do the work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you don't know Jesus, and I can look around and there's no one who doesn't know Jesus, but let's be bold. When you live the way of the Spirit, you have that boldness. Let's be bold when we go out there and talk to those who don't know Him. Amen? If you need prayer, anyone need prayer? Everyone needs prayer, but it's specific. Okay, let's pray for Mahdi. Lord, we pray for Mahdi, who's going to be heading down to Southern California to deal with the, the death of her son. And Father, she's heartbroken, and we pray for for her comfort, for her safety, for her in her travels, Lord. We pray for Tori Coomerly, who's moving to San Diego. We pray for safety. We pray that you would just be there and she would see you in her life. We pray for Marilyn, who moved to Southern California and has a challenging job there, Lord, caring for a, a, a sickly person, being the main caregiver. We ask a blessing upon her. And Father, Va, we pray for Va's family. Va passed away. We pray for comfort for his family. And Father, there are so many we can pray for. And Lord, we come this morning knowing that prayer brings glory, your glory, to this world. And so we, Lord, are tapping into that vehicle of glory. And we pray that we might see those things that we lift up to you with great expectation become reality here on earth. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. God bless you.